Okay, so let's look at an advancement of learning by Seamus Heaney. Now, the title of this is particularly important because what we, as we said in class, the idea of an advancement of learning comes to Seamus Heaney um, not as an original thought but as a reference back to the philosophical work of Sir Francis Bacon. And so what we need to remember is that this title is something that he has commandeered. It's something that he has taken from the philosophical work of 1605 by Sir Francis Bacon because what it describes it really is the narrative of the poem. Remember this poem is about the speaker learning something that through learning something he gains power. And Sir Francis Bacon in his treatise of 1605 stated that knowledge is power. And so that theme from 1605 is very much relevant here in this poem because the speaker learns that knowledge will bring him power. Knowledge in relation to the rat that he encounters will give him the, the power that he needs to overcome his fear, his instinctive fear. Okay, so let's move on. Right, so here you have a really yucky rat and um, again the reference to the rat links to the AO4, the biographical information, because the speaker, who we take to be Heaney in this autobiographical poem, autobiographical poem, uh, we take it to be Heaney and we know that Heaney has had this um, lifelong fear of rats. So what we have here is a poem that will allow him to overcome that. He will advance um, both physically as he, he moves out of the picture, uh, off the embankment, but also he will advance as a person emotionally and um, psychologically because he overcomes his fear of the rat. And look at the wee thing, who would be scared of that running up and down your leg? Okay, so back to what I was saying there about Sir Francis Bacon. There's Sir Francis Bacon there, and his name is just Bacon, like a good bacon bap. And his name is Francis, and that's with an I because he's a boy. And his philosophical work was in 1605. So again, this will link to your AO4, this will link to your contextual information. And the theme of that philosophical work was knowledge is power. And that's what you have here because knowledge is power for the speaker. So the philosophical work, there you go, there you there you have the, the title within the, the title of the philo philosophical work, the proficiency and advancement of learning. Um, and here it's just been commandeered. It's been taken by Heaney because in his poem he realises that by learning about the rat he can conquer his fear. Knowledge is power. Okay, oh, that's a bit skew with, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. I can't really do anything with that. I'm not quite sure. Okay, so what we want to do is, um, if you have a little look at the poem, um, now we've studied this in class, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk through the different stanzas. So instead of writing on each stanza as I did in class, I'm going to talk through them just to give you a bit more information. So I'll just move on, or I'll read it for you. So an advancement of learning, Seamus Heaney. I took the embankment path, as always deferring the bridge. The river nosed past, pliable, oil-skinned, wearing a transfer of gables and sky. Hunched over the railing, well away from the road now, I considered the dirty, keeled swans. Something slobbered, curtly close, smudging the silence. A rat slimed out of the water and my throat sickened so quickly that I turned down the path in a cold sweat. But God, another was nimbling up the far bank, tracing its wet arcs on the stone. Incredibly then, I established a dreaded bridgehead. I turned to stare with deliberate, thrilled care at my hitherto snubbed rodent. He clockworked aimlessly a while, stopped, back-bunched and glistening, ears plastered down on his knobbed skull, insidiously listening. The tapered tail that followed him, the raindrop eye, the old snout. One by one I took all in. He trained on me. I stared him out, forgetting how I used to panic when his grey brothers scraped and fed behind the hen coop in our yard on ceiling boards above my bed. This terror, cold, wet-furred, 
small clod retreated up a pipe for sewage. I stared a minute after him. Then I walked on and crossed the bridge. And there you go. There's the, his advancement that he physically advances, but he emotionally and psychologically advances too. Okay. So as we said in class, some new words for you, deferring that idea that he puts off crossing the bridge. There's a particular reason why he does that. We don't know what that reason is, but instead he retreats to the, the, the quiet, the, the isolation of that embankment path. And of course, we're taking that to be the Ormo embankment path. That is the, the photograph that you saw just on the very first slide. Pliable, um, here that word's used in relation to the river. And what we're really thinking about it is not easily bent as such, but that suppleness, that ability to flex, those qualities are perhaps the ones that we're going to focus on a little bit more. Because what they do is they they parallel the river with the animal that he meets, the idea of the, the supple flexibility of the rat. Bridgehead, now bridgehead is part of that sort of military semantic field. Military semantic field. That's used throughout the poem because a bridgehead is a position, a uh, position to be held beside a river. Of course, he is beside a river. It's usually on the enemy side, so it gives you that idea of power, and um, we'll, we'll look at that uh, as well. Why it links into the semantic field there? Well, of course, it's a military term, but the military semantic field throughout this poem lets us think about the dual battle, the dual war that's going on. And that's, it seems to be on one level the battle between the man and the rat, but the, the primary battle is the, between the man and his fear, the speaker and his fear. Insidiously listening, that idea stealthily, treacherously or, treacherously or deceitfully doing something, an insidious enemy. So it gives you that idea that something seems harmless but isn't. And again, that links to the idea of, of his fear that the rat, uh, a rat in relation to a human is is it's harmless um we've got over the plague and after all it wasn't the rats it was their fleas that was the bother there so you know a rat really hasn't got much um hold over a human unless that human scared witless of a rat which is, of course is the case for our speaker okay so i think the first image the important image there is the idea of the river itself so I took the embankment path as always deferring the bridge and again that the, the idea about why he doesn't take the bridge, why he puts that off, um, it's not really mentioned but of course he doesn't put it off forever because he does advance and he does take the bridge. But um, the key image here in this first stanza is the idea of the river itself because the river itself is in some ways... Um, in some ways, it is described or represented as an animal. So you've got that. I'm going to move highlighter here, blue. So you've got that metaphorical representation of the river as an animal. And if we go back to that word, um, when we talked about pliable, when we talked about that supple, that ability to flex, just as an animal can in its own environment. But you've got the verb choice. Nosed is an important one. Oil skinned, of course. Now, the river itself is dirty, the river is unpleasant, but the oil skinned perhaps makes us think of animals that will inhabit the river, can inhabit the river and the land, such as the rat itself. Okay, now when you describe um, something with human characteristics that is not human, that's personification, and when you describe something with animalistic um animalistic characteristics when it's not an animal that's zoomorphism so zoo morphism okay and what you have here is Heaney using zoomorphism to describe the river in a way that links it to the the animal it, it says as you said in class Dan it foreshadows the arrival of the rat and it creates I think the key thing is it creates this idea that we're in an atmosphere that is unpleasant, okay? We're in an atmosphere that is unpleasant, that is unhealthy, it's insalubrious. When they think about the water, the water here in the river, you think of its viscosity. And when something is viscous, um, you, get, you have that idea of it, its thickness. And the river is described in that way, you know, oil-skinned, it's thick with pollution, 
um, and you have that idea again that this is this is a polluted environment, that it's an unhealthy environment. And yet he chooses, the speaker chooses to come into this environment rather than take the bridge. And perhaps we're questioning that choice. OK, then also in, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Then in stanza one, you've got the enjambment because stanza one links into stanza two. So perhaps that's done because of the flow of the river, that sort of slow flow of the river. Um, you've got the river nose past, pliable, oil skimmed, wearing a transfer of gables and sky. So you've got that sort of slow, and I'm going to write sluggish, sluggish movement of the river, because remember it's thick, it's polluted. Um, that sluggish movement is there with the Anjomo. Um, and then the river itself isn't mirroring the image, but instead it's a transfer of gables and sky. And you can see that in the image that starts this PowerPoint. You can see how the gable walls of the terraced houses and the sky is is reflected on the water. But here it's he doesn't use terms like reflected. He doesn't use mirroring. He says transferred. And again, it gives that idea of a, of a, of a dullness that we would associate with such an insalubrious uh, place of, with polluted water. What you've got to is the idea that you've got the slow moving state. So even though you've got the enjambo, the river nose past, pliable, oil skinned, wearing a transfer of gables and sky, the slow movement of that, like wearing, oil skinned, pliable, they're all multi-syllable words. So we're not creating a fast pace here. We're creating this slow, sluggish movement. And perhaps that can also reflect the sauntering movement of the speaker as well, because he's sort of, as the, as the, um, the rat is described later, he's aimlessly walking down this path as well. And he takes time to stop. He stops to consider. So there's this inactivity um, between the speaker and the river. And it's important that we see that inactivity, this sort of slow pace of stanza one and two, because that inactivity of the speaker and of the river will contrast sharply with the rat. It's a brisk, um, brisk, f m erratically moving creature. Um, and that is in sharp contrast with, with the speaker and with the river. Okay. Okay, so the speaker then too, in the first two stanzas, you've got that idea that he's well away from the road now. So because of that, there is a sense of isolation, a sense of, of remoteness, that he's isolated, it's just himself and the, the environment. And remember, the environment that he's in is not just an, a natural environment. It's an environment, I suppose it's a, it's a confluence point. Because it's the meeting of the natural world and this sort of built up um, urban landscape. So it's both urban and natural. And you can see how those two things interact when you look at the metaphor of the, the dirty um, keeled swans. Um, so remember there should be an N in there. Okay. Because... That metaphor of the, the dirty keel swans, it gives you this idea that swans are usually associated, as you said in class, swans are usually associated with graceness, uh, gracefulness and purity, but here they're contaminated by this man-made landscape, landscape. So dirty keel swans, that metaphor gives you this idea that, um, that man has contaminated the natural world, that the natural world has been polluted by the, the impact of man, the impact of our urban development. Okay, so then we get to stanza three, and stanza three allows us to um, see the rat for the very first time. Though we don't actually, uh, I suppose that's the, the wrong way to say it, because we don't actually see the rat. What we see is um, the speaker's reaction to the rat. Um, so what we learn is through his reaction. So we see the rat sort of, ooh, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Hold on, rub that out. Bum, ba -dum, bum, bum, go here, okay. Okay, vicariously means through another person. And therefore, what you have here is a vicarious view of the rat because we don't see the rat, what we 
learn or what we see or what we experience is the speaker's reaction to the rat. And the reaction to the rat is an instinctive one. It's an instinctive one. And initially, that instinctive fear that um, comes across, it comes across through oral imagery of the ear. So you've got the sibilance, okay, of smoothie, slobbered, smudged, slimed, and you've got those harsh uh, consonant sounds of curtly and close. And what they do is they create this idea of a very a very harsh soundscape into which the um, animal enters. And the harshness of those sounds, the sibilance and the consonants, the harshness of that, really what they do is they mimic the disgust of this of of the speaker and they make us as the reader feel disgusted as well perhaps that word slobbering links back to um the idea of a childhood fear because slobbering is quite um quite a childish word and what he does here is he uses it to describe the rat so for the speaker perhaps the, the appearance of the rat brings him back to the, that sort of childish state where he's instinctively scared of it where he cannot control his fear of that and perhaps the use of the word the sort of childish uh, word slobbering allows us to understand that what you've also got to is the idea that he feels the physical effect of the rat upon him and you've got that with the with the idea of his throat sickened so quickly all of that comes out as a physical fear. And as you told me in class, that's his reptilian brain taking over um, where he acts instinctively. Let me write that down. Okay, where he has his reptilian brain taking over. The idea of the, the rat smudging the silence, and again, you've got that metaphor. Um, oh, hold on. Highlighter more. I wish the highlighter was actually a highlighting colour rather than a dulling colour, but sure, you can't call it the dull lighter, but you know what I mean. But you have that metaphor of smudging the silence again, this allusion to the, the grubbiness of the scene. You have this idea that um the 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 rats has intruded into a moment where the the, the speaker was contemplating, where he was um sort of withdrawn withdrawn into that sort of world of isolation where he was alone but not lonely and and the rat has entered in there and the the arrival of the rat is an unwelcome one and what you also have to then folks is the idea that the speaker's reaction seems to be um it seems to be immature it seems to be um unreasonable when it's juxtaposed to what's actually happening which is a rat arriving in the scene Okay, now I think it's really important that you that you co concentrate on the enjambment that you have between stanza three and stanza four because it's so effective. The enjambment um that links stanza three and four really starts off with the the word something at the start of stanza three and goes on to the word stones in stanza four, so it. It takes in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines. And whenever I try to say it, I'm breathless. Because if I read it to you now, something slobbered, curtly, close, smudging the silence. A rat slimed out of the water and my throat sickened so quickly that I turned down the path in the cold sweat. But God, another was nimbling up the far bank, tracing its wet arcs on the stones. So I'm actually running out of breath by the time I get to stones because the only point that I've had to breathe is perhaps that comma after, but God. Now, what you also have there is the idea that the panic of the speaker is communicated through the constant motion of the lines and the rapid the the the, the pace here um really intensifies and the reason why the pace intensifies is because it's mimicking the exasperation and the anxiety of the speaker um, and it's clearly an exaggerated fear and so therefore that fast pace um, of those run-on lines mimics his breathlessness, his panic when he's confronted with his greater fear. You've also got a nice little moment though of uh, where you have that dramatic pause, where you have the caesura 
the use of the colon to introduce the rat. So you have a dramatic pause and you could almost say that perhaps um, something slobbered, curtly close, smudging the silence. We as a reader don't know what that something is. So the something creates the idea of a mystery. It creates tension. And you could almost say that that the tension is deflated when we find out that what that something is. It's a rat. Um, but it's def it might be deflated for us, the reader, but it certainly isn't deflated for the speaker because the speaker's panic is intensified by the fact that it's a rat. You've got to then that exclamatory phrase, um, but God, which again links back to how great this fear is. And the idea that the the um the speaker now as we acted this out in class, the speaker can is on a pathway, so he can only move forward or back. He's in a path on a path, but the the rat is moving in an arc. It's moving like this, or it's moving like this. So you have this idea that the rat has trapped the speaker, that the movement of the speaker is limited by the, the path that he's on and the appearance of the rat. I suppose that links to the idea of, of progression. He while As long as he has the sphere, he's going to be limited. He, there, there's little progress that he can have as long as he has the sphere. So in order to allow him to progress psychologically and emotionally in his life, what he has to do is get rid of the rat, get rid of the fear. So you have this idea that the rat is not close by him, it's up the bank. Um, it's tracing, it's 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 tracing its curves um on the wet stones. It's not really interested in him, it's far up the bank, and yet he still feels vulnerable. And um, the speaker still feels acutely aware that the rat's there, and that increases his tension, increases increases his fear, makes him vulnerable. Okay, so <clears throat> And then that links on to uh, what the speaker finds incredible. Um, you have that idea, incredibly then I established a dreaded bridged. I turned to stare with deliberate thrill care at my hitherto snubbed rodent. And what you have, why it is incredible is because the, the speaker can't believe that he's in this position, this in position where he's going to face his fear. And the position that he's in is a sort of a paradoxical one. He's in a paradoxical position because he's in a position where he is both vulnerable. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Let's get rid of that. Okay, where he's both vulnerable because he's facing his greatest fear, but also he's powerful because he is facing his greatest fear. He, he's going to do it. Um, so there you have this idea that there's this paradox. And that paradox is also borne out by the language because you have this phrase dreaded bridgehead and we talked before about what a bridgehead is that it's a position of control on an enemy's riverbank so you have this idea that it's a bridgehead I established now he he uses that kind of subject verb combination he says I established I turned and and all of those things are powerful I established, I turned. That subject verb thing is powerful because he chooses to do something about the situation rather than just be a prisoner to it. So he's he is being powerful in that respect. But the other thing then is to he's what he's doing is he's stealing himself for a battle and you've got that the military semantic feel there of bridgehead he knows that this is going to be a battle this is a war that he can't lose and it's a war between himself and the rat and it's also an internal struggle a war between himself and his fear but then if you look at the adjective dreaded now dreaded doesn't suggest power because it suggests a weakness that is that if you dread something then you do not look forward to it happening you feel a victim to it you feel that it is something that has control over you so by having this um by having this um idea of this adjective and and this particular noun what you have is is that paradox that he feels both vulnerable and powerful it's a battle that he has to face not just between a man, an animal and man but but between a man and his own fear and of course if he wants to progress in life he has to he has to 
learn. He has to know how he can feel power in this situation. And he's going to feel power by gaining some knowledge. So he says, I turn to stare with deliberate and thrilled care. So what he is, he's stealing himself to engage with this fear deliberately. This is the moment where he's going to do it. It is a, a moment of climax. It is a, a moment of climax because it's a moment where he's going to engage in, in the biggest battle that we'll all face, the battle between ourselves and our fears. Oh, don't know what's happening there. Oh, maybe that's how I can get a different colour. Right, I'll try to work that out later. And also too, as we said in class, that world thrilled is important because again, it's the first time we've got anything positive to say in this in this situation that um, as he steals himself to gain knowledge and to gain power, that there can be some sense of positivity in this for him. Okay. So here we have um, at this idea that he has, in stanza five, he has come across the rat. This is the second encounter. So this is the, the reason why it's a second encounter, because it's the encounter that he's going to stand and face the first encounter he tried to run away. And already, folks, I wonder how I got that colory thing. No, it wasn't that. No, it wasn't that. Right, I don't know how I got that. I'll have to go back and explore. But if you look at this, there's the suggestion that there's already an advancement in thinking because he uses the word hitherto, which means up until this point. So up until this point, this rodent had all this rat had always been snubbed. It had always been something that was avoided, but not any longer, not anymore. He's going to do something about it. So by stating that up until this point, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, the speaker would snub the situation he now finds himself. He implies that this is no longer the case, that he's going to do something about it. And also this idea of a new perspective that comes out very clearly from the fact that he doesn't call it a rat. He calls it a rodent. And that's important because, first of all, rodent um, sounds more mature than rat. Rat was his childhood fear. Rodent is no longer a fear. It's, a, it's an adult understanding. It's that idea that he sees it for what it is. Not what it was, and what it was was just the stuff of nightmares. So he no longer can, he no longer sees it that way. And also, what's important about the term rodent is it has this sense of emotional detachment. He's no longer emotionally involved with the creature in the same way that he was. Now, this isn't a complete and utter magical transformation. The fear is still there, and it still can be seen in certain points throughout the poem uh, once we move on from this point but it is a fear that is being conquered and what you have is you've got by calling it a rodent new lexicon a new word choice because it's not invested with those childhood nightmares that he had before okay so what does he do then how does he gain this knowledge well he gains this knowledge by scrutinizing by studying exactly what he sees in front of him rather than by layering upon that rat or that rodent all of the emotional baggage that he had from childhood. So the description that follows is, if you look at it, it's um, the rat clocked worked aimlessly a while, stopped, back bunched. Now you've got that idea that it, it back bunched it in itself. To, to bunch up its back like that suggests perhaps that the rat is fearful for its own safety. It's listening again, perhaps and that insidiously listening now there that that idea of insidious means harmful um when you think about that that harmfully listening the speaker still has um a certain suspicion of this creature he hasn't automatically been transformed to a point where he no longer fears everything about the rat so again that insidiously listening that's a little trace of, of the fear that's still there but what he does is he looks at the detail of the rat. And when he looks at the detail of the rat, then he, he can see it for what it is. Um, you've got that tapered tail, the raindrop eye. And so the description that happens here in the second um, encounter with the rat, it concentrates on the physical and visual aspects of what the rat actually is, rather than his emotional reaction to it. He is now an observer, okay? 
He's no longer trapped in the headlights of his own fear. He's an observer. And the idea that if 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 you can observe in a, sorry, observe in a detached way, then that's gain, that's gaining knowledge and that knowledge will empower you. But as I said there, the insidious that idea of it's it's secretly dangerous gives you the, 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 the idea that the fear is still there. He's just trying very hard to conquer it. Okay. So stanza seven and eight where he looks at the detail of the rat, that really is um the turning point because what it does is it juxtaposes the past and the present. The past which was that fear, the fear of all the, the rat and its grey brothers and what it would do with the present. And when he looks at the rat, look at the alliteration of tapered tail and look at the, the, the metaphor of the raindrop eye, okay? Um though that, that alliteration, that metaphor metaphor alliteration. Okay, and it's not just the alliteration of the T, it's the T A tapered tail. And the T A that it softens the sound and that softening links to the idea of the rat as as maybe fragile and vulnerable, and you get that with the idea of the raindrop eye. It, it's the raindrop eye sounds delicate. It, it sounds beautiful, and it gives you that idea that he can see the rat now for what it is. And even with that old I, idea of the old snout, um, it's almost it, it's almost cute. Uh, it has this sense of endearment. And what he does is one by one, so it's not, whereas previously we had the fact that emotion overwhelmed him, multiple emotions overwhelmed, overwhelmed him and his throat sickened. What we have now is we don't have that um, idea of many, many emotions happening at once. We have this idea that one by one, rationally, responsibly, reasonably, this speaker is becoming more and more aware of what he sees. And when he does that, one by one, oh, now there we go. Oh, look, <gasps> yay, I can figure out how to do it. So when he does that, you have this idea that his fear, di oh, now hold on, make it go up here. His fear dissipates. Oh, that's brilliant, look at that. So his fear dissipates. Knowledge certainly is par here. And the speaker can get rid of those nightmares. The nightmares that follow on, the idea that he refers back to, he says, I stared him out, forgetting how I used to panic when his grey brother scraped and fed behind the hen coop in our yard on the ceiling board behind our bed. Oh, sorry, there's my phone going off. But you have that idea that he can forget now because his fear has gone. Again, linking to the uh, the um, military dialect, you have that military image of that he trained on me. Again, that this is a battle that's ongoing, but it's a battle that we know he now can win. It's the final psych psychological battle, and the speaker wins it when he says, "I stare, I stared him out." forgetting about the past so I stared him out again subject verb combination gives him power suggests that he's doing something and the ultimate victory for him then is this internal one where he forgets to feel the fear he forgets to feel the panic and the terror and those things no longer count those things are gone and just back to that idea of you know the rabbit uh, the rabbit <laughs> The rat as almost cute. Um, he uses that term of endearment, the old snout, but also he also gives value to it by the fact that one, he's called the rat he rather than it. So he clockwork aimlessly. He's also humanized it. He's also humanized it by referring to his grey brothers, and again, which which is almost personification. You know, you, you don't really think of rats having brothers, you think of people do. So what you have there is this idea that he he can move away from the instinct of fear and he can actually go to the other end where he starts to put a value on this rat um, to almost humanise it. Um, and in doing that, what he does is he robs the rat of its power to terrorise him. And then... Ultimately, he says, this terror, and again, that idea, terror was the potential that the rat had. 
what the what it was in his past life but now this terror is and then he describes it as cold wet furred small clawed so the word terror there the word terror is ironic because it's not it's no longer a terror um instead what it is is this idea that the poor wee thing is it seems pitiful it seems vulnerable it's cold, it's wet furred, it's small clawed, and um, it seems like a, a something vulnerable. And again, he, he gives that idea of almost endearment. We, we can almost feel sorry for this. The speaker can see past his fear and he can see the creature for what it is. And the fact that it retreats up a sewage pipe is important because the rat and his fear and his phobia, they go away. They go up a pipe for waste products because... The, the rat and the fear, but mostly the fear, that is a waste product. It's, it's detritus. It's not needed anymore. It's a waste product. And therefore, it's apposite. It's appropriate that it disappears up the um, sewage pipe. And when that happens, then he can cross over the bridge. But not only is he doing that, he crosses not over this physical journey through the bridge, but it's a psychological journey to a new a new way of being. He's unfettered. He's free, free from that fear. He can advance because learning and knowledge has given him that power. He can ad- Okay, so folks, if we think about the rhythm and the rhyme here, um, the key thing is that we've got this irregular rhythm and the irregular rhythm perhaps is important because it reflects, you have this idea of the speaker's reactions and um, the the, the speaker acts in, in um, quite a sporadic way um, when the, the rat appears. And then he has that incredible reaction where he starts to look at the rat. So it's an irregular occurrence, meeting the rat. And the speaker's reactions to it are irregular and the rhythm is irregular. And what the rhythm does is the rhythm, most importantly, um, through the use of enjomo, what it does is it mimics those reactions you've got that really fast pace between stanza three and four and you've also got the enchomo stanza one where you've got the sluggish movement of the river and the sluggish movement of the speaker so the key thing then to remember about rhythm is that it links to it's erratic it's um irregular and it links to the sluggish movement of the the speaker initially and then the panicked movement so uh, oh hold on the sluggish flow of the river first time and of the speaker okay and then the panicked reaction and the quick movements to be found in stanza three and four also in relation to rhythm you've got the caesura you've got that dramatic pause to be found after stanza three before we have the revelation of it's a rat and you can almost say that that caesura is is deflated you know the drama is deflated somewhat when we find out it's only a rat but not for the speaker because the rat is his ultimate fear and then you've got that idea um at the end of stanza nine when you've got um I stared at so I stared a minute after him, then I walked on and crossed the bridge. You've got those short sentences, um short simple sentences, stanza nine, which are, are, are very declamatory. They they just declaim, so they just say, That's what I did. I stared after him and then I walked on. And what it does is it, those short sentences, what they do is they give a definite sense of closure, a sense of acceptance, a sense of finality. Folks, tone. I think it's important that you see that the tone is, um, in some ways, the tone links to the idea of of movement, um, because what the poem does is it tracks this epiphany, this climax, this moment of insight that uh, the speaker has, um. So initially, we've got the tone, which is perhaps trepidation that he's in this isolated place, it's an insalubrious, it's an, it's an unpleasant isolated place. You've got the pessimism of that idea of the dirty keel swans and, and his uh, fact that he's isolated, he's away from the road now. And then the second tone then that takes over is that tone of panic that comes out with a but God. And that tone then is 
um, consolidated and strengthened by the enjama and the quick movement and the rhythm of the lines between three and four. And then the tone changes again for a third time. The tone becomes more objective. It becomes more detached because what the speaker then does is he starts to be rational. Um, he starts to be rational. And when he's rational, he um, then can have this more objective tone where he can look and see what is happening. He can see it deliberately for what it is. And then finally, finally, the fourth tone is a tone which is, I suppose, empathic. That idea of, of almost having an understanding of the vulnerability of this poor creature. Um, and also a tone that is accepting. Oh, I wanted to do a highlighter for both of those. It's empathic and accepting. Because he accepts who he is. He accepts the fear that he had. And he accepts now that he can move on for it. And he accepts also too that... Um, uh, like the like Francis Bacon, both acknowledge that. Bum 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 bum. What do they both acknowledge? Get me my rubber. Let's get rid of this. It won't rub out. Won't let me rub out. Oh well. But what they both acknowledge is that. Oh, don't want that. That knowledge is power. Okay. And this is a great poem, a wonderful poem that you can connect with uh, with the other Hardy poems. You could connect this one in relation to man and nature, the, the relationship with man and the natural world, how man and the natural world in this poem immediately seems to, they seem to be at odds, they seem to be enemies, but actually it's the natural world that allows man to overcome that fear. Um, it's the encounter with the rat. And the knowledge of the rat that allows the speaker to overcome that fear. And you could compare that to overlooking the river Stir, where, for example, nature and man appear to be in harmony throughout that poem. But as the poem develops, or rather at the beginning of that poem, but as the de poem develops, you see that nature has actually been um, a trap for man that has allowed man to forget the, the more things that lay behind. So... Uh, this one could be compared with um, overlooking the river stir. That would be a great one to do it with. But you just have to see on the day. Okay, super dupe, that's us.